Okay, hello. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. So just as the Paul said, I'm working in the Nokia Krakow and at the same time doing the PhD candidate. I'm doing my PhD at the Agehai University. And the content of the, of the following slide will be actually the composition between the, uh, my PhD thesis and the, and the testing that we are doing in the, in, in the Nokia in the Krakow. So, uh, so let's start with the, uh, with the outline of the whole presentation. The, uh, actually, I think that most of you know what is the regression testing. Basically, it is the checking whether the, the new code, so the new functionality didn't break anything that, that was working before. So, so let's keep that. And uh, to, on today's presentation, I'm going to tell you about the scale of the problem, especially in the Nokia, so the big multinational, multinational company uh, that works with its own software. Then I will give you some simple but efficient solution. I call it for the lazy people, which is not bad. And I'm going to uh, tell you why the laziness in, 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 in business is not bad. And uh, after that, I will provide you with some, some, some idea that is much more complex that actually involves the machine learning in, 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 uh, introduce in optimization of the regression testing. And I will finish with some, uh, some, some conclusions. So, uh, that is the problem. The, the pretty image of the skyscrapers is not, uh, is not by mistake here. It that didn't mean to, to, to actually to fill the slide, but it's connected with the problem. So uh, the regression testing is, the, is like uh, with, uh, expanding the city. At some point, the uh, QE that we want to execute uh, during the regression is so big that we actually can't see the sky. So we don't know the scope of the whole problem. And the, it is connected with the organization uh, as the corporation that is the Nokia. We have the, com uh, we have the, uh, the offices in different sides of the world. We have the office, obviously, in Poland. Uh, these are two offices. We have uh, offices in Finland, in France, in Germany, in USA, in India, in China, and many more countries. So this makes the problem that uh, there are at least a few thousand testers and much more developers that uh, works in, in, in different places of the world and different time schedules. And it affects the regression. Uh, at the same time, Nokia, to maintain uh, uh, its position in the market, creates multiple products. Uh, as we know that customers have different needs, so there are different products designed and created, so different scope of testing is requested to be uh, to be executed to maintain the, the uh, overall quality. From the regression testing, the problem is that most of the regression testing is the same for each product, but uh, these are slight and small changes between, between each product, but um, the important assumption is that most of the uh, regression suit testing is, is actually quite the same. So uh, the next thing that is uh, the third one from the top is that each new feature, so each new code request actually uh, the new regression testing. That uh, the magnitude, ho how many tests are added to the suit, that depends on the feature. That might be no tests, actually, be, because it, it might happen that new functionality is covered by the old tests. But there are situations that many tests are related to new functionality, especially when uh, technology has changed, for example, from the 4G to 5G and the, from the today's 5G to the upcoming 6G. So there, there is the, the, some breakpoints in the regression testing that uh, many of tests are dropped and we, uh, testers are requested to create the new ones. So uh, as, as the, final, uh, the final step in this, in this slide is the observation that regression testing, just as the city, as I mentioned on the beginning, is growing with each new defect found or the new, new each uh, feature introduced. So uh, we need to introduce the automation of that. And this is the point where the machine learning can be, can be used to, to, to encourage the, the overall testing pipeline. So these are the numbers related to our uh, regression in, the, in the, my part of the organization. Usually I'm, I am working, I was working as a tester and now I am working as a machine learning engineer. So we have about 2,000 tests that are executed daily that compose the average daily regression suit test. Uh, this is pretty much number and especially when we look in the in some time frame, so 2,000 tests make these uh, 14,000 executions weekly, and that makes more than 700,000 executions per year of almost the same content. So we so we repeating, repeating, repeating the same test up to 700,000 executions of the very same problem. So that is the uh, one of the clues that. What, what, 
why we would like to uh, to improve the, the the overall testing of the regression because of the repetitiveness of the process. So that is the the idea ground for the machine learning because uh, 700,000 ex executions are 700 uh, results of the testing. These are logs. These are the status of the test, and and so on, so on. So these are pretty much data set to be used uh, with the machine learning algorithm. So 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 this is the scale that helps actually with the automation from the machine learning perspective. <coughs> uh, by saying so, I I think that you already know what is the motivation behind using the machine learning in the process. So if you start from the left top from the slide, we know that the new software requires. Uh, uh, next batch of the regression set, uh, testing. So the new feature means that new feature, new software means that the new features were introduced in the part of the software. But just then we need to define what we're going to test. The, the regression suit is composed of two things. That is the existing suit that actually we take that, uh, the very same tests that were executed yesterday on the previous build. And, uh, and as I said before, we may need to add some additional tests that are related to the new functionalities. So it may happen that the, for, for a few days, for the few executions, the testing suit is the same, but it's slightly changed with, with the time. So, so there is no, there is some rep repeatability in the, in the content, but it actually changes after some time. Uh, so after the uh, composite of creating the final testing suite, we run the process. So that is the traditional regression testing process in, in a nutshell. So we're creating the testing suite, we execute tests, and we repeat that every day until, until the product is maintained. Uh, so uh, on, on the bottom uh, part of the slide, uh, there are motivation behind using the machine learning in such process. Uh, we want to address the, pro the problem of growing testing suit. So, so with the new technologies, the testing suit is growing. So we want to uh, reorganize testing QE to improve the testing. That is the important part of this presentation, that we don't change the content of the testing, but we reorganize the, uh, this co uh, the, let's say the QE of the testing that we are executing. So <coughs> uh, for that, these are two, two heads on the left. For that, we need actually two, two, two people to be involved in. That, that is the engineer related to the testing, usually, and the business owner. Because in, the, in the, such companies, we have two worlds that we need to connect. The, on the left side, there is the testing and machine learning engineer ju that just want to Im improve the process to make it as most uh, accurate as possible that doesn't care about the actual market situation. And there is the business owner that uh, makes some assumptions that must be met to, to, to maintain the position of the firm, firm in the market or and to maintain, let's say, the product overall quality. So, so, so uh, com the, the common uh, ground for these, uh, for these uh, two people in the Nokia is that we can't uh, change the scope of the testing. So we don't drop the tests, but we, uh, add, but we are allowed to change the uh, in which order the tests are executed. That, that is because uh, some tests uh, are failing often. Some tests are never failed, uh, even after the year of the execution, there were no failed, uh, fails found by those tests. But it may happen that eventually, at some point, uh, with the irony of the life, the, the, the test will actually fail by, by some reason. So, so, so we don't want that as, as the engineers working with the machine learning because we will, at some point we will be the one who got the blame for the error to be spotted on the market because our machine learning, our algorithm actually uh, dropped the test so that some functionality wasn't tested. So that's the, that's the point of the whole connection between the business and the testing that we don't change the scope of the testing but we reorganize the original one to be much more, to be more, uh, uh, to be improved, which I'm going to tell you about in the, in the next slide. So the final goal is that we want to left shift the, the curve of the found problems to the left. Um, as you, if, you want to, if, you go, if you will look on the left side of the, of the slides, there is uh, some chart that, that describes the density of the failures of the of average density of failures of the test regression test testing in the, in the company. What is interesting that the distribution is uh, resembling the normal distribution or also called the Gaussian distribution. And the, the second interesting, interesting thing is that it, that such distribution, that the normal distribution actually models uh, most, of the, uh, most of the situations in our life, which is pretty good because it has some advantages. 
related to the mathematics. And uh, if, we, if we assume that the left side is the actual process, so the testing, uh, testing suit is started and we find some errors, some uh, later errors are found, and then testing suit is, uh, is finished. So that is the actual process. We want the, the whole process to be left shifted. So the, uh, as uh, you see on the right side, we want the, the density of the failures to be, to be shifted to the left, so the whole process found, find the very same errors earlier and in the, uh, in the bigger numbers. So we find the very same errors that we could find uh, in the normal process, but at the beginning of the process. So we have much more time to, to fix the errors, and we can actually finish the testing earlier. So that, that are the goals for us that we want, uh, to, we want to achieve. So left shift of the curve of the file test, so we can find that the very same problems that we could find much, much more earlier, and the uh, density of the failure is bigger, so the, so, the, so the magnitude is higher, so the whole process ends actually quicker, so we can uh, feed the resources and don't waste the power and electricity and so on and so on. So uh, that is the, the main goal of using machine learning by us in the, in the regression, uh, regression testing. Oh, I promise you about the efficient solution for, for the lazy people. Why I, why I said that laziness is not bad in, in such business? Because laziness actually means that we look for, for something simple, something fast, and something easy to implement, that we don't waste much more time and resources on it. And that is actually very well welcomed by the business people to have such resolutions that are easy to maintain and are cheap. So we do we will, uh, don't much much we don't do that much of work, but we're generating the profit. So that is the, the ideal situation. So we are being paid for being, being lazy, actually. And the idea behind this is that we, if we have the history of the testing result for each software, so for the, each software build, we can just count the probability of each test to be failing. So we know some tests are failing much more often. Some, uh, some tests are non, uh, didn't fail in the, in the past. So we can assume that if the test is uh, probable to fail because, because it actually fail, failed in the history, in the recent history, let's say for the, in the last uh, half of a year, we can assume it will uh, fail this, day, this time also. So we just take the, the tests that are, have higher, high probability of failing, put them on the beginning of the QE, and we generate our profit. So, and we are here of the company because we improve the testing process in such a lazy way. But uh, what is the point of the machine learning if you can uh, use the very s such uh, simple solution to get the, the interesting result? And uh, that is actually a problem with the lazy, the na naive approach that it doesn't reflect all situations. So it doesn't um, cover for, let's say the changes in the software. We, we just assume that the test uh, failed often, that it will fail also this time. But we actually ignore what, what, what happened in the software. We actually ignore what was the dynamics of the changes uh, within, the, within the development process between the development groups. And that is the main problem with such, such, appro such approach. And uh, with adding some additional logic, we actually moved to the machine learning resolution that we applied in the Nokia in our regression, regression suit. So uh, we need to spot the difference between the, the very same test to be failing and the very, set, the very same test to be passing. So, uh, so, so, so we need to find the difference between the previously working software and the one that is failed. And sorry for the mistake, because I see that I mixed the colors that the fail is green and the pass is red. So let's switch it in your mind. That wasn't intended. Uh, so uh, we need to know the difference why, uh, why the test failed. So what was the reason behind the failure? So what actually changed within the software? So uh, that is the data that we look to, that we dig through the repositories to find what, what changed. And uh, we hope that we will find some logic in, in, the, in, the, in this whole mess that, is, that developers are doing as our test, uh, from our testing point of view. And we want to find some, some, some trends that could be helpful to find uh, whether some tests should be executed or whether some should, shouldn't be ignored or just moved at the end of the queue so they could wait for the execution. 
Uh, and that is the, uh, the base of the idea that we introduced. If you will look on the uh, left side of the slide, on the, uh, and you can assume that the blue arrow is the timeline of the, of the process. So each, uh, each box is the, is the next day. So you have uh, day zero, so today's build, that is build A. We have build from yesterday that was tested with the regression suit, that is uh, build B. Uh, they pr the, from previous data is BC and so on and so on up to some constant day in the history. We use uh, history from more than IS, yeah, so we have at least few hundred uh, bills that, that are used uh, in, in, in our algorithm. <coughs> and I said that we need to know what, what was the difference between the builds. So uh, we invented the, the solution that creates a deltas between, between the software. So, uh, so we generate delta A as, as in the slide, delta B, delta C, and so on at, at some, at some uh, until the, 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 the list of the builds are uh, finished. And what is important the, that the uh, deltas are not the consecutive paths between each build. So we don't create the deltas between build A and B and then build B to build C, but we rather uh, extend the scope of the changes by, by, by looking through the data. So we we take build, today's build, that is build A, then we compare it with the build B, that is the first uh, delta A, then we take the same today's build A, that is uh, the one that we want to test with the next build in the history, that is build C. So that is the span of the one day uh, covered by the changes, it, uh, that is delta B, and so on and so on. So at some point, there is the one big delta between the bills that covers the, the whole history of the regression testing between, uh, between that might actually span different technologies and different situations in the market. And that is actually important for us because when maintaining the deltas that are the consecutive paths of the next days, we couldn't find some, uh, some important information that, uh, I mean that the resolution of changes would be always small, so we couldn't see it, so, uh, the actually the amount of the trend line, of the changes of the dynamics between the build that happened be, uh, at some period of, periods of time. And uh, by having this, we, uh, we know that machine learning needs data, needs number, because machine learning in, in basically is the Excel file or just the, the multiplication by matrix by the matrix, so it's the numbers. For that, we found that uh, each software in the Nokia contains uh, about 250 software components. By the components, you, mean, you might think that this kind of the class, kind of the functionality that does, uh, that performs some functions. So that is some, some abstract view to, to, uh, to enclose the uh, part of the software in, in under one label. So each component has several files in the source code. These are the uh, C files, these are header files, uh, some scripts, some YAML files, JSON, and so on and so on, some configurations that are used within the software. So uh, each component is related to the number of the files. So uh, if we know, if we have the access for the repository, we know that some files change in some way between each build. So there are commits that uh, are adding some code or and there are commits that are dropping some code. So uh, we can use that, collect that information to know what was the actual line of code changes within each file that is related to each component. And we can use that as the, uh, as the value that describe the, the magnitude of change of each a file and each component. As the, we have 250 components and there are several different files that describe the, uh, the, each component, we finish up with about a few thousand uh, uh, columns in the single vector that describe each delta. So this pretty much, uh, usually it's quite sparse vector because we, in, in most places we have the zero because nothing changed in some areas and that is the thing that we <clears throat> that we want to pursue, that we see that some places in the vectors that describe some areas of the components are, have, um, have bigger changes than the other ones. So these are the trends in the software that we want to pursue, <clears throat> that we want to use in, the, in, in our logic. And, and uh, in the right side there is the, in the plot uh, presenting our deltas. <clears throat> Each dot is the delta between two bills, so delta A, B, C, and, and so on and so on. Uh, for the dimensionally the reduction, we use the PCA algorithm because we had to uh, shrink the size from a few hundred uh, 
uh, few thousands of, of, of numbers to just to two dimension space that we use the PCI for that. And just at this point, before even the algorithm of the machine learning is applied, we see that data uh, forms some kind of, of, of groups. So we can assume that, is some, that, that there are some, <coughs> some common parts where, where some where between the bills. Uh, were happening the, the, the common changes in, in the common area. So that is the, the clue of the idea that we, that we found at some point that changes in the software can be grouped in some, in some, uh, in some clusters that reflects the, the, the dynamics of the change in the software uh, and reflects some changes in the, in the market that, ha that are happening in the, in the, in the whole business. And, and, and uh, we pursued that and we applied some additional logic onto that. <coughs> uh, so to, 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 uh, to uh, cover all of the things I said, uh, three important assumptions that I uh, wrote on the bottom of the slide that uh, we all need to remember that each delta is uh, kind of definition description of the uh, relation of the changes between, but between the previous bills up to the today's bills that we want to test today. So, uh, by using that, we know that similar data describes the similarity of the changes of, uh, in the software. So, describe the similar uh, situation, the history. And the interesting thing is that by, by, by grouping in such a way, we actually don't uh, care about the, uh, the, the timeline of the changes. So, that might happen so that the, some components were changed like six months ago. And, some com and the same components were didn't touch by, let's say, the next three months. And then, again, the new feature were introduced that uh, changed, uh, all, again, the very same components. And uh, by, by, by using this approach, we actually ignore the, the, uh, the, situ the timeline. And we, st we still are able to, to, to actually to group the very same situations in, 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 uh, together in to form some clusters. So that is the important thing, and uh, such deltas and uh, such similarities are uh, connected with one important thing. Each build in the history has its own testing history, so has its passes and has its fails. So actually, each delta from uh, today's build to up to some point in the history, so let's say for the delta C or D, uh, pointing to the build that was uh, f within which that delta was created. So Actually, we point to the to the test that failed. So we, you see you see the connection now. So we have the, the dynamics of the build that that changed. So we know what changes in the software, and in the same time we know what actually failed for that change. What what failed at time in the history when there is such change in the components, and that is the the, the connection to actually optimize our uh, <coughs> our regression suit. So. That is actually the algorithm for, for, for the, to, be, to be used, that we use. We use delta A as the prediction sample that we use for the testing, as the, uh, as the actually the sample that you want to, to, to uh, generate the results of the, of the, whole, uh, of the whole answer. For that, we use this simple clustering algorithm because our data is already pre-processed and, and we see that uh, just the PCI is uh, good enough to, to, to find the classes between them, so no need to apply uh, deep networks, but we can. Uh, but, but, but we decided to use some... Uh, we are lazy as uh, almost everyone, so we use the simple approach to be faster and to be efficient. So we use the simple uh, clustering method in which the uh, distance between the points are uh, counted with the Euclidean distance. So we count the distance between the points and then uh, we group the uh, samples in, in some clusters. Uh, in the example, you see that we use two clusters, and that is just the, uh, the example because uh, that is the parameter that we, as the owners of the, of the algorithm, we need to, to decide. That is the hyperparameter of the whole resolution, of the whole approach. Uh, how many clusters uh, we want to use because there is some trade off. If we use two classes like this, we are sure that the coverage of the tests pointed by the, by the similar builds are. Uh, quite big, and we uh, and we know that we can, uh, we can actually be sure that we will cover more uh, all of the problems by 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 using those similarities. 
but at the same time, we actually select much more tests to be reprioritized and to be put on the beginning of the queue. We can, small, uh, we can lower that number down by using much more clusters, like, let's say, uh, example, 10. But that is the trade-off that uh, by making the cluster smaller, we actually uh, uh, decrease the, the amount of the test to be selected by, by, the, by the algorithm. So there, there might be the situation where such small uh, part of the testing queue will be affected, uh, but uh, we actually risk that some problems might leak to the to the process, and actually we can uh, we we may not find it by 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 our approach. So that is the parameter that must be optimized to be verified in the research to actually to be to be sure about the uh, the, the the final results. So we have the clusters. We have the delta A as the prediction sample, so we just need to uh, check to which, um, to which cluster the, the sample is uh, the closer. So these are the group of the builds that we want to use for further uh, definition of the, uh, of the problem. And so uh, we know, for example, we are in the cluster one, that is the orange one, the pretty color. So we, what we do now, we collect all of the builds from which the delta was created. So we have builds today, and we see that for several, let's say, say hundred of the builds, the, delta, uh, the algorithm found some that the deltas uh, are telling us that there was some changes uh, similar for the for the latest change from the his, uh, to the to the history. So we actually know that uh, these are some similarities in the tendencies on the dynamics of the change in the software. We know that. Uh, by looking only at this, that we know that the orange builds have some common changes uh, with, the, with the latest changes. So uh, we know that the very same things that uh, change. If we know these are so-called similar builds, so had similar changes, similar tendencies, we can just look through the history for that build and to select the test that failed for that build. So we have that, that is out the prediction. We found the similarities in the process in the software components. And we can assume that if the, almost the very same thing happened for, uh, within the development for that component, we can assume that the very same test will fail for that, for that change, for these areas, for these functionalities. So we assume these tests are the ones that we want to prioritize in the whole QE. And then that happens the prioritization. So we move the selected test in such a way that these are uh, put it in the beginning of the QE and, and we want to execute, it, execute them in the first place. And then we just wait for the results and collecting the profit for, for the whole company. And that, actually, that simple approach is actually working. And, and I will show you some on conclusions, some notes that the, on the, let's start from the bottom uh, part of this slide, that uh, the difference between the date, delta clustering approach and the uh, pool selected by the lazy naive approach was uh, reduced by 30%. If we have about 2,000 tests, that uh, marks the average regression suit in, the, in, 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 uh, in our company. The naive lazy approach by using only the probability approach selected about, uh, if I recall correctly, 700 tests to be prioritized. That is pretty much, that is almost half of the, of the QE to be, to be shuffled. And we shrink it down by the 30% by, uh, by introducing s uh, simple searching through the, through the changes in the file. So, uh, so that is the point for the machine learning to apply some additional logic to reflect some, some knowledge that is hidden deep in the, in the data to, to, to improve the process um, uh, even further. Uh, what is interesting, what we found that in total, that just the 25% usually in average for the whole testing suit is actually finding the bug. So 75% of the, of the testing suit for each regression execution didn't find any, never finds anything. That is interesting. That is the problem of the scope that only smart part of the testing for in some situations find the bugs and others are actually just wasting space, wasting memory and the power. But this may, must be executed and maintained before we are never sure if those tests won't find anything particularly interesting from, for the development. Uh, what I didn't mention here that uh, we didn't use the content of the test. So, the, so there is the whole uh, natural language processing area that we could use. And we didn't approach that way yet 
because we didn't look through the content of the tests, uh, so so the, all the keywords, the, the functions that happens in the in the regression testing suit, and we believe that the, such an explored space is is rich in the uh, is very rich as the source of the information because we can map the actual content of the test, so the, all of the keywords, name of the technologies, the name of the functions, name of the components that are written in the code with the actual changes in the, in the history. So that, may, that is a risky approach that might actually add some noise and some problems to the, to the approach, but, but, but with, uh, with some effort we can actually match the content of the tests with the actual failures, and that, that uh, is the way that we will approach in the next few months to, 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 to use actually know about the language uh, in the test to, to Connect it in, in it somehow with the uh, with the regression testing with the with the dynamics of the changes in the software. Uh, as I said, we use the the quite easy approach with the clusterization, but deep neural networks can be used as well, like the autoencoders or the, the variational parts. We can use autoencoders uh, as the form of the encodings of the embeddings of the data. So we, if we know that we have a vector that spans for seven. It's about the 7,000 columns with the numbers. We, uh, we can use the deep neural network to, uh, to, to, to encode it into such smaller, uh, smaller uh, space uh, called the latent space because it's hidden bit, uh, within the deep neural network and to assume that we can just use it as a generative model. So the model that uh, is ready to, to, to use the, the previous historical data and to provide us with the with the with the prediction in, in fly in the go. So so that is the one approach. The second one is the graph neural networks. Uh, graphs in in the current uh, machine learning market in the in the research areas are the hot topics because uh, the researchers found out that the graphs are very good, very interesting ways to to describe some. Uh, some situations in our life that uh, graphs are a good way to model some problems. So if there are some, uh, some flows, some algorithms in the lives or some situations where some blocks are connected, uh, we can use the graph neural networks to, 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 to maintain the very same approach. Uh, for this, what, we, what I presented here, what we are doing in the company, we can assume that uh, each node of the graph is the component. So if the whole bit has about 250 components, that is the full connected graph, and <clears throat> uh, each delta can be described as the subgraph of the whole resolution. So we know that 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 uh, only part of the of the nodes are composed with, so are, are connected with with the nodes, and we can assume th this as our training sample that there are changes uh, by as the part as the subgraphs of the very same graph that uh, are described by some values like let's say, example the test that failed or or, or any different numerical things and the final notes are that we uh, as our primary goal we want to find our bugs faster and we don't want actually we, we can't uh, reduce the testing suit size so that is the approach that we don't change the scope but we use some logic to reorganize it in such way that we can uh, find the very same bugs, but much more earlier to give more time for the developers to, to, to fix the, the problem. Uh, and as I said, the time passes and we lose some information if all, all tests are still usable. We're, that is the problem of the, of the, of the all processes that, uh, that were ever created that we need some maintenance. And the, the same maintenance is connected with the, uh, with the testing. Uh, with that uh, automated test, but we as the machine learning engineers that improve the the uh, the regression suit testing, so we want to that we approve the uh, let's say f uh, bug sketching rate. We don't uh, have the power uh, or the ways to find which tests are usable or not. So we can't. Uh, we that is the uh, one of the downfall of the whole situation that we can't affect the data. In such way that we want to. That is the uh, that is the problem related to the business that we can't uh, do anything that we want. We are the, just the machine learning engineers, and we need to to somehow connect uh, with our problem with the with the business needs of the company and some some regulations made by the by the folks that control the business. 
Uh, yet, it is not bad to stick with the old and big regression suit if we can reorganize it in such a way that the very same suit will be finding the new, the new errors, new bugs. We can uh, live in that way that we find the test, that uh, find the errors and drop all of the, uh, I almost say the, the bad word, uh, we drop all of the unnecessary uh, tests on the end of the QE and doesn't care about them either. So, so we can live it that way. Uh, and one important e thing is that not all failures in the test uh, that, that test as uh, reported as uh, failed are related to real bugs, and we need to <coughs> to watch out for that because some failures are related to the environment, uh, some bugs are related to the let's say some initializations error attacks, some library uh, that are used by the company didn't start well, so 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 the whole test didn't didn't even start, so it's blocked as the as the failed one. Um, there might be the problems that there are some even some timeouts in the local network because some, something happened in the network. That actually happens quite often that one tester breaks some uh, breaks the testing environment of the other tester by by accident uh, uh, actually. And it might happen that the test failed not because of the bug, but because of the situation in the in the laboratory. So we need to, to, to find whether the failure is the real one that find that found the bug or whether the failure was by some 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 accident. Uh, well, that's all. Thank you for listening and I wish you happy testing and if you have any question I will glad we will be glad to answer for you. Thanks Sebastian for sharing this scientific insight. And yes, there are a couple of questions. So let me start with the first one. So in general, the question is a bit longish, but let me start with the, mm -hmm. with the first line. So how do you address risk of reaching only local optimal spot in test suite execution optimization? Well, that is the trade-off that we need to be aware of, that we may able not to find uh, find some strange situation. That is just the machine learning and we relate on the historical data. So uh, yes, the, the algorithm can, can, can find some sweet place to, 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 to work with, so the local optima. And, but uh, there is the problem of the whole the machine learning uh, uh, research that uh, model never finds the global optima. That is, the that is the assumption that we work with. We will never find the ideal situation, but the, we are looking by the, by the training of the model to find the, the best, uh, best spot in the data that we have. Okay, thanks. And then the next one, uh, what about flaky tests? So tests which failed because of problem with uh, test itself, not related to change in software. How to tell? machine learning algorithms to skip such tests during, during learning. Yeah, that is the, uh, the idea of the whole data science, data engineering. We need, to, we need to be able to find whether the problem is connected with some environment or some other things, or whether the, the sample was related to the, to the bug itself. If we have the testing history, that is obvious that we know what, what failure was connected with which, which error. So uh, the test that found the, the real error is connected with some ticket in, 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 in the, some, let's say, some Jira backlog that is related to the error. So we use that, uh, that samples and we drop all of different failures to not to make, add, to not to add any more noise to the, to the training process. Okay, thanks. And here goes the next one. Do you think it's worth to implement ML in testing nowadays as it seems quite complicated and it just slightly improves the tests? Uh, as I said, in most situations, no. Actually, machine learning is a is, is, uh, uh, thing that costs money and costs time and might be quite problematic to be implemented. The machine learning is the very fine way to, to, to uh, let's say, improve some things, but in very certain areas. It's not the magic one that you do some, some abracadabra and it works. It, the, the situation is, is just uh, best for everyone. The machine learning is just a tool, just like a hammer. You need to know where to, where to use it in which situation. So, no. In most of the cases, the simple, naive approach that I, uh, that I told in the slides with use, the probability of the testing will be efficient to, to, to find the very same problems. Okay, thanks. And so far, the last one. Do you have some way to exclude project files which change with every change, like git ignore file and so on? Uh, yeah, that is, uh, that is the problem of uh, generation of the data set. So 
Uh, from my experience that uh, I'm working at actually a few years with the machine learning in the, in the company is that 95% uh, of, uh, of the process of, the, of introduction of machine learning is related to the uh, preparing the data. Machine learning algorithm and the research is only like the 4% and the 1% is the fixing of our stupid mistakes that we did in the, in the past. So, so like the 90% is the preparation of the environment, of the data, of creating the process of the cleaning data and, and ex, uh, extracting the meaningful things. And uh, actually Git is pretty good in, uh, in passing because uh, we, can, we, can, uh, we can look through the repository and, and use like, the additional files, not the only the history of the differences that were, that were committed through the, through the GIF, but also by the, uh, by the configuration of the Git, like the Git files uh, that are you know, ignored and so on. So, so that is the whole logic that we need to create as the machine learning engineers that relates to the preparation of the data. Thanks, Sebastian, for such an extensive answer. And that was the last one from Discord, so still a couple of minutes left. Any questions from the audience? Okay, so two hands in the air, so let me start with the first one. Wait a second. I have a question about uh, the testing the components. You told mm -hmm. us uh, that you test, um, your whole regression suit tests something like 500 components. What's the relation between them? Because I was thinking about the similar approach of prioritizing testing in my, um, in my project mm -hmm. and um, retell the connection between tests and the, um, the plugins. But the dependencies of plugins um, uh, resulted, the analysis of dependencies of plugins resulted that <coughs> there are too many dependencies and we always ended up with uh, something like most of the tests are highly <laughs> prioritized because of the dependencies. That's why we said let's ignore that thing and don't look through the, through the source code because <laughs> that had some additional problems. We don't want to have so some, some much problems in the uh, in the start with, so we decided to drop the content of the file, so, so all of these import li uh, between libraries and so on and so on, and we just focus on the magnitude of the chain. So that is just the abstract view that all that code uh, had like 100 uh, lines that were added and uh, 20 that were uh, deleted, so the, ch uh, the overall change is 120. And by that, we only see that uh, some files change. So within the component, something changed, and uh, there might be the slight change or the very big change. And we base on that, that uh, with the assumption that if there is the big change in the component, in the files related to the component, that we can assume that there, there was some uh, lot of work done by the developers there. So we assume that. Uh, we don't care about actually what the, in, in such approach I presented, we don't care about the content of the components, what they are doing, what are the functions, but we care about, about them as the areas of what happened. So uh, we match the, match the difference by the, by the areas that, 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 that uh, had some changes, and we, uh, we assume that uh, if something changed for one build in such manner, in such magnitude for in, the, uh, in the history, uh, we hope that if the, in, in the recent builds uh, there was the, some amount of the, of the change in, in, the, in the files of the components, so the very same test will fail because uh, the same functional area was, uh, were, were touched by, by the massive commit uh, of the code. I had a question about how many test cases you were able to remove from the overall suite. You uh, said there was about 30% removal. How much of that was duplicates, and how do you define or find, identify those duplicates? Uh, I'm not sure if I can tell you about the true numbers, because some business guy will kill me about the, uh, telling the truth about the process. That is internal, but uh, let's use some, some broad numbers. So as I said, we have, in average, 2,000 uh, tests that are in the average regression suit. So um, the duplicates, we did some initial research about the passing the content of the testing files, and we see that about 10 or 15 percent tests can be dropped just by the similarity of the test of the content. So that these are about 200 tests. 
the naive approach selected in average like 700 tests to be executed in the first place and, and then the delta clustering algorithms uh, in average found about the 400 to 500 tests so like the 25% of the scope of the of the original scope to be executed okay thanks anyone else okay here's the third one I have one question about the uh, number of prod bugs uh, that were reported after you start using that kind of uh, functionalities on your tests. Yeah, that is the interesting question because we need to differentiate between the old bugs that uh, are existing in the backlog and the new bugs that are just found by the test. So uh, there are situations where, uh, especially in the aggression testing, where let's say three days ago some bug was found so the ticket was created and we know that the bug is not yet fixed because the developer guys are, are finding for searching for the root cause. So for the next consecutive three days up to today, we know that uh, the test will fail, so it is failed by the existing ticket ID. So there is, uh, there is a metric in which we find whether the, uh, whether the test found the new bug or was closed by the, the bug that is already existing. And when, uh, if you ask for the exact number of the new bugs, uh, that exactly depends on the, uh, on the, on the situation of the software. So that, that's obvious that some builds are uh, less prone to the errors and some give, get generating more problems, but uh, daily regression actually doesn't find that much. That's from one to up to, to five errors. That depends on the situation. So that's a good thing for the company, so that the most of the software is actually working as expected. Thanks again. And any final question? Anyone can see? So. This means that would be it. So thanks again, Sebastian. Thank you all for listening and for the talk.